In this episode, I'm going to talk about two totally different subjects, one grip fighting and another one, the world of belts. So stay tuned for an interesting show. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Scott, and welcome to another episode of Freestyle Judo. Well, today we're going to talk about actually two totally different subjects. One will be the world of belts and belt ranks that we use in judo and martial arts. And then we're going to switch gears quite a bit and talk about competitive grip fighting. And we'll cover the basics of it as well, but we'll talk about some competitive aspects of grip fighting and how how vitally important it is to any sport that uses a jacket and belt. But that comes later. Right now, let's talk about what I always like to call the world of belts. And I got that phrase in 1977 while I was a young man as an athlete representative and also as a young coach had a starting out teaching. And when I say young, I was. I learned that phrase or picked that phrase up from my good friend and mentor, Bill Clark. And he had nothing to do with judo. He didn't know a thing about judo. But he was involved in the Amateur Athletic Union at the time here in the Missouri Valley area, which was uh, western Missouri and all of Kansas. And they had the AAU back then, I think still does, has about 58 or 60 territories, and that's how the geographics of it. But anyway, we were having a meeting, a judo committee meeting, and Bill was there basically to referee for the AAU. And uh, the subject of belts came up, and everybody started to argue about whose belt was this and whose belt was that. And in those years... A lot of you old-timers will remember belt ranks were a very contentious uh, subject. Uh, Fact is, even there was a court settlement about it. So that's another story for another episode. But nonetheless, it was a very contentious subject. And after the meeting, uh, Bill said to me, and Bill, you know, I was in my 20s, and Bill was probably in his 50s, and he took me aside. He said, young man, he said, you seem to have a little more common sense than some of these people. He said, uh, he said, he said, I didn't hear you talk about uh, your calendar events for the upcoming year for your competitions. I didn't hear you about, you know, coach training. I didn't hear you talk about uh, anything really pertinent to what you should be talking about in a in a sports committee meeting. Because back then, AAU was the governing body for judo in the United States. It's before the uh, Presidential Sports Act of 1978. He said, all you guys were doing was arguing about whose belts were, were phony and whose, weren't, whose belts weren't phony. And I said, yeah, I know. He said, well, he said, you know, you people, you live in the world of belts. And that's where I caught the phrase. And he was right. We were so wrapped up about our belts, we forgot about the main thing to do was to teach good judo and to promote judo to the public and all that other good stuff. So that's why I started calling it the world of belts. And from that, I'm just going to do a bit of a rant, but I'm going to hope I don't insult anyone. I don't think I will. I think I'm just going to try to talk some common sense. But also... I also want to talk about um, the history of belts. You know, well, how did they come about? Did they just fall out of the sky? Well, remember that Jigoro Kano, the founder of judo, he's the guy who really started what we now know is the, is the belt system we use today in all martial arts. All the other martial arts in Japan picked it up, then others picked it up as well. So it was Jigoro Kano who actually formulated the concept of using grades or belts because he was an educator you know he had different grades in school and that's how reading all the stuff that's how he viewed it and in a lot of references you read historically that's what he looked at he wanted someone to graduate to another level of expertise or skill and wanted to have some way of of um, organizing that and which is actually a really good idea so but some some people have taken it off the rails to where it's just crazy so we'll, we'll talk about that a bit but i want to First, preface this, I have three references I've been using, and when I'm talking about the history of ranks and belts, uh, the first one is right up here. It's The Way of Judo by John Stevens. Excellent book. It was a portrait of Jigoro Kano and his students. Excellent, excellent book here. Here we go there. And um, I would recommend buying that. If you're a history buff like me, certainly do it. Another one is by Christopher Clark, and there you go there. It is... Saving Japan's Martial Arts. It is a very good book on, again, history of uh, judo. It has a lot about the judo history in here, so a very good book. I use that as a reference. And then one of my favorites is by Sid Hoare. 
uh, a Brit who wrote a history of judo. And it is, if you can get this book, any of course, if you get any of these books, get them because they are solid. And it is a very good history of judo. So these three ref- references, and again, I'm using them as references, and anything uh, opinionated comes from me. It's not from them. So I don't want to, if, if anyone has a bad, you know, they, I said something that may have upset you. It's not these authors saying it. It certainly is me saying it. So I hope I don't upset anyone, but I might. I'm sorry. Because the history of belts, in, certainly in the United States and, and worldwide, but, but certainly in the United States, has been contentious sometimes at best to say the best about it. But let's let's look at the history of how this thing got started. I, I said before that Jigoro Kano himself was the one who started the belt ranking system as we know it based on the old uh, Minkyo system or the licensing system that was used previously in other forms of the more feudal jujitsu systems. But uh, in so in when Kano formed his the Kodokan, which by the way, here's a historical note. The Kodokan was formally established, and I think this comes from uh, John Stevens' book. Uh, Kodokan was formally established by Jigoro Kano on June 5th, 1882, and as an institution, the Kodokan Judo. Previously, in February of that year, he opened uh, what he called the, the Kano Academy, the Kano Juku, and it was uh, it, it, Judo was a, a side part of it. He was teaching his, his form of jiu-jitsu, as it were. He didn't really formalize Kodokan Judo into Kodokan Judo until uh, J- June. So February, he started teaching uh, the early aspects of, Ko- of Kano Jiu-Jitsu, as it were, and then he formally called it the Kodokan uh, in, in June of 1882. That's a little bit of history. And again, it all started at the Aisho Temple, a very small um, Shinto temple in the Tokyo area, I believe. And that's how the, the, the foundations of it. So that first year, there was no real ranking. He, he, he might have used the Kito system because he was accredited in the Kito Ru system, I think, is the, in the Tenjin Jinyo Ru. He was also in those systems. He was as forms of jiu-jitsu, which he studied. He was a licensed instructor. But uh, in 1883, he formally started the rank system. And he, he he was the first to use a black sash, and it was just a sash. It wasn't the belt as we know it now. Those came along later, the heavier uh, woven belts that we, we now wear. Those came along later in, in Judo's history. Um, not too long later, but somewhat later. But So it was a black sash he first used to designate uh, a graded person, a, a don grade, a udancha, uh, a person of grade. Okay, so he's he's made the grade. Okay, so not so much he, he's graduated, but he is is of a higher level. So he's going for more further learning. And initially, that was in 1883. I'm looking at my notes here, and in 1884, he promoted the first two people to shodan, the initial grade, and they were uh, Tsunajiro Tomita and uh, Shiro Saigo, two of his favorites, and went on to be greats, you know, in the world of judo. And they were the first to be the first Yudansha or black belts or graded people in Kodokan Judo in 1884. They, they were men, but for the ladies, and I think it's important to know because uh, women have played an important role in the history of Judo. And the first woman to uh, earn a black belt at the Kodokan in Judo was uh, a woman named Katsuko Kosaki in 1933 and again that comes from my source was john stevens in his great book the way of judo so um that's an interesting thing to decide to know by the way the first female student was uh suiko ashia i'm sorry if i slaughter the name uh suiko ashia and she actually enrolled at the kodokan in 1883 as one of the first students so that's an interesting thing to know as well so a little bit of history of judo of the the rank system uh further um, in 1884, when Kano formulated the, the Don grades, he actually only had three of them, Shodan, Nidan, Sandan, three grades that wore the, wore the black sash, as it were. And he, and he had that three student grades, or Q, um, as a, a Sankyu, Niku, Iku. Okay, they weren't brown belts. Uh, from what I'm reading, and I forget who what the source was here, when one entered the Kodokan initially, um, you wore a blue belt to signify that you were a new student, a newbie. And then after a period of time, you were allowed to wear a white belt. 
And then from that, you uh, went, went on, I think eventually at some point in the 18, 1880s, started using a brown belt to designate the uh, student grades. So that there were three. And then later on, as, as time progressed and, and went on, uh, they expanded to the five Don grades, then five student grades, five, five Q grades, then five Don grades for the black belts. And then it wasn't until um, uh, they expanded the system to 10 Don grades later. Uh, and I think in 1932, I'm reading from my notes, I'm looking down. Um, uh, in, until 1932, all Don grades were black belt, okay? And uh, up to that time prior to that, they, I think, expanded it to, to 10, 10 Don grades. And then in 32, they changed it where the first five grades were black belt. And then from sixth to ninth Don was uh, 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 red and white belt. And then 10th Don was red belt. Uh, Kano never claimed rank for himself. He was always just referred to as Shihan or, uh, you know, past master of, of, of something. So um, that's kind of a bit about the um, the uh, Don grades. And um, so that, I think that's interesting to note, uh, the, the history of it a bit. Um, so, so we're seeing seeing how things have evolved. And, and the, the colored belts became more commonplace when judo expanded to the West and we saw in, um, in in Great Britain and in Europe uh, the use of colored belts and more more student grades. And uh, I, th I think it was uh, Koizumi in, in Great Britain. Some of you Brits out there watching may may correct me on this, but I think he was the first to use uh, colored belts in Great Britain and, and probably in Europe. And then I think the French also went uh, when the, the Kawaishi system that, uh, in their in their judo. He was one of the early pioneers of judo in in France. Uh, he went with a, a larger number of belts, colored belts as well. So that's where we got that. It's kind of a bit of the history of it. But belts can be used for benefit or they can be used for detriment. Uh, hey, I've been around a long time, well over 50 years in this game, and I've seen it not just in the United States, but I've seen it in a lot of places where belts are used to uh, you know, put a hammer on somebody and control them. I mean, it it's a political tool for, for many people, for many organizations, and we've all heard stories about that. Okay, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of those things personally, but they're also good for um, for using as a motivation for people, not just for kids, but for adults. It's a great external motivation. You know, I, I know when I was a 13 year old kid and I, I got my yellow belt, okay, and earned my yellow belt. Boy, I was thrilled, you know, and and I've seen thousands of kids over the years that I've coached. They were thrilled to get their yellow belt, too, or whatever color belt it was. And same with adults. I mean, it's, it, it gives you a, a, a goal to reach. And I've used it myself, and I know a lot of other people use the different belt levels as, as great ways for um, uh, developing your lesson plans, your class outlines. You know, I know a lot of good coaches who do that. So it, it has a great benefit from an educational, from a teaching standpoint. I think that's what Kano wanted us to do, to, to use it for the benefit of teaching and, and having these goals these external goals for students to reach. Um, I know a good friend of mine does not use any belts at all. He has uh, his club colors that they wear, and and that's that's fine. He doesn't use belt ranks at all. He's a judo man, and they don't use any ranks at all, and he's totally against them. And uh, he's been offered rank by the organizations because he's quite good, and he's turned it down to, to his credit. So, you know, that's something to be said there too. I know in Sambo, we have two belts. We have red and we have blue. You either wear a red jacket or, or you know, an, an outfit when you compete, or you wear a blue one. And so we have two belt colors, and I like that. And, and certainly in our AAU uh, judo program, we have, uh, you know, one, one athlete will wear a certain colored belt. The other will wear another. It's either white and red or white and blue or could be blue and red, you know, whatever the you know, our rules are written so the director of the tournament can designate it. But on the scoreboard, that if, if you're on the white side or if you're on the blue side, that designates what belt you wear, mainly for keeping track of who's who on the match. And that really certainly helps me as, an, as a referee and, and all referees. So that's important. But let me tell you just a few horror stories or some crazy stories about belts. And let me talk about some good stories about them, too. Uh, I can tell you this is a fact. Uh, uh, one time back in the early 90s, I was running a practice and a fellow called. He was from out of state and he said, uh, you know, I'd like to, you know, I'm in town for a, a couple of weeks. I'd like to come and practice with you guys. Hey, you know, sure. Come on in, bring your gi and come on in. So he did. He showed up and um, he showed up in a, a 
perfectly, in fact, it was ironed judo gi. It was perfectly, almost starched. It wasn't starched, but it was a, a beautiful white judo gi, snow white, with the, the, uh, the sleeves were actually pressed. They were sharply creased, like a military-type press. It looked quite nice. And he showed up in a very impressive red and white belt. And I would say he was probably about 40 pounds overweight. And he was a man probably in his 40s or 50s. And, you know, if that's what, that's fine with me. You know, it's fine. And I was running a practice at the time. I think I was sixth on. And, but I was normally, my, my practice, it was and still is just to wear my black belt, certainly in practice. Maybe for special occasions, I'll break out the red and white belt. But, you know, it was just a practice. So we were, we were all at about 15, 20 guys on the mat at the time. We were still at a really strong competitive club, especially for our juniors. But these were our, our seniors, and they were quite good. Um, and we were having, we probably had about, I probably had about eight or 10 black belts on the mat with me and several brown belts. So it was a good, good level of expertise on the mat when this fellow walked in the door. He walks in, very gracious, very nice. And when he says to me, he bows to me, that was quite nice. And we shook hands and he said, and I will use, I will call him John Doe. Okay. He said, I'm John Doe, I'm John Doe Rokudan. And I thought, uh oh, one of these. And he quickly said, you know, John Doe, Rokudan. Okay. So being the, you know, smart aleck that I am, I said, well, pleased to meet you, Mr. Rokudan. He said, oh, no, 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 that's not my name. That's my rank. I said, oh. And he, then he says, and what's your rank? And I said, well, I'm just the kid head coach here. You know, he's practicing. He said, well, well, what's your rank? And I said, well, I'm a Rokudan too. He said, well, why aren't you in your red and white belt? I said, because it's practice. You know, now, if, if you want to wear your red and white belt in practice, go for it. But that's just not my style. And he, it was perplexing to him. So he got on the mat and, uh, he was generally quite pleasant. We were running through drills and everything. And, and, um, he several times when he, and he participated, he was, you know, give him his credit, he was participated. And so anyway, it, it, every time he would stop with, with one of my athletes and he'd try to correct them on doing something. And actually he was wrong when we were doing a particular thing, he would, and I'd say, no, I said, we're, we're actually, we're drilling on this now. We don't, this isn't a time for coaching or correction. Uh, I said, I'll come around and correct them if they need it. But I said, right now, let's just keep drilling. Okay. And I was very, very professional, very pleasant about it. He was too. There was no harsh words ever exchanged, but you could tell he was very output. And he said to me several times, he said, well, what, what rank is he? What rank is he? Or what rank is she? And I'd say, well, that person's a need on, or that person's a showed on or whatever it might be. And, and he said, he said, oh, okay, very good. And he would be very officious about it. And his, his whole thing was the rank. And um, he never came back. But, and, and that was nice. We, you know, he never came back to practice. But the two evenings later, I got a call from a local younger judo, judo coach, very good man, and had a nice judo program in the area. And he called me and he said, hey, do you know John Doe Rokudan? I said, yes, I met him already. He said, well, he's coming to my club tonight. And he said, he's here right now. I said, well, okay. He, he said, he told me, because he outranked me, that he was to take over my class tonight. For, for, and he had kids at the, on the mat at the time. He said, he was going to take, take over and teach the class for me, and that, uh, you know, I had to do this. And I, I, said, I said, well, uh, who pays the rent every month? He says, me. I said, who, who, who not only bought the mat, but cleans the mat every day? Me. I said, who's the head coach of your dojo? He said, me. I said, did I answer your question? He said, yeah, you sure did. And he politely informed the gentleman that uh, he was the head coach. And if he wanted to step, if, if he were, wanted to step in and, and when asked would show a technique, that'd be fine. And which he did. But that was a problem. That was a situation where someone was too uh, impressed by their own rank for their own good. Okay. So th those things don't help judo. They don't help in any sport, no matter what the martial arts. And we've heard about some of the other martial arts that basically sell rank. And we've all seen this through the years, too. And if you've been around as long as I have, you've seen rank sold. Okay, it's, been ha it's happened. You've seen people, organizations use rank as a hammer to control people. We see that a lot. That's the bad side of rank. Okay, and that's, that's, that's not what, you know, we should see. If, if, if you're using that as rank, if you're using it as a hammer over somebody, or you're, you're using it for the wrong purpose. It's, Kano, I think... And I can't read the man's mind. He's been dead many years, but I can read what the man wrote, read what people wrote about him. He was an educator, and he used the ranks as a means to help further the education of people in the, in the uh, activity of judo. 
And so that's the purpose of ranks. Now, some good stories about ranks as a coach, and I've seen it in other coaches too, and in other you know situations where not just kids, like I said, but adults are thrilled to get that rank because you know what? It's a it's a motivation. It keeps them going. You know that show don show not don means initial grade, and that's to me that's like um, graduating from a good college. You know, it's a. I used to say high school, but I really, it's it's like graduating from college. Once you get your show done, you've you've got the basics. You 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 have your area of expertise you like. That's that's you know you kind of worked on, but you're not quite there yet. It's like getting a bachelor's degree. And then the higher don grades, the way we look, certainly we will look at it in our judo black belt association is exactly what I'm saying here. The higher don grades, then your nidan sandan on up, uh, they're like working on your masters. Okay, they're working at a good university. And when you get your Godan, Rokudan, fifth, sixth Don, certainly when you're wearing a red and white belt, it's almost equivalent to being a PhD um, in, in some other form of education. I'm not saying it's the same. I'm not saying you have a PhD once you get to be a red and white belt. Do not misunderstand that. I'm just saying it's similar. That's how we look at it in the judo world. So that's what ranks do. And you know, and you as a coach, if you're a coach out there, how many? smiling faces have you seen some some little kid who who got whatever the first rank he or she earned and they're thrilled and they're hooked and you know you can now teach them more and teach that good physical education of judo because that kid loves what he or she did you know and that, that it's it's a great motivation i've seen that smiling face so many times it's it, you know it's it's a wonderful thing and so ranks should be used for that purpose and that's to me the world of belts i used to have a harsher opinion about it and when people discuss it i'd really lay it on the line no use hashing over some egregious things that happened in the past but they have happened in the past but let's try to use ranks and let's live in the world of belts that we have because it is a world of belts. Whether we like it or not, it's with us. And so if we use ranks and belt ranks for the purpose they were intended, the physical education of, ju- of judo teaching people judo, I think that's the real reason we should have ranks. So anyway, that's it on the world of belts, and it's my rant and rave, and I hope I didn't insult anyone or and I didn't use John Doe's real name, but... Um, I think it was worth repeating that story. So there we go on the world of belts. Okay, let's talk about grip fighting. And it is grip fighting. Now, we know gripping is an essential part of what we do. Anytime you wear a jacket and a belt, uh, that, you know, even if you don't have a jacket and a belt, you know, uh, tie-ups and everything, you have to hold on to your opponent. The first thing you do to an opponent, the first way you touch him is with your hands, okay? And so (laughs) grip fighting is... Is from the get-go when Kano started judo himself in 1882, it has been an essential phase of what we do in judo and certainly sambo, jiu-jitsu, any, like I said, anything with a jacket and a belt. Um, so grip fighting is essential. Now there's a difference between gripping and grip fighting. Okay, grip fighting is the fighting for the dominant grip in a competitive situation or a fighting situation. Okay, gripping is another matter. Uh, that again is important and Kano himself was the one who started what we, we now call kumikata okay the, the, the natural or formal the basic grip okay um, so we'd have some basic level to start from okay he started lapel and sleeve uh, he started that right from the early days of judo we've been doing it ever since for the purpose of everybody starting out at the same level okay so we both got the same grip now we can go now there are people who love the kumikata, and that's what they do in their competitive careers, and they've thrown a lot of people with this grip, great, okay? But don't be married to kumikata. You know, it's not the only grip we use in judo or any form of jacket grappling, you know, so so keep that in mind when I'm talking about all this grip fighting here. Um, and But it's a tool. The jacket's a tool. The belt's a tool. Use them as for what they are. They're tools, Okay. Uh, so let's look at some basics of grip fighting in this first video. It's a little over five minutes, just a, you know, just a few seconds over five minutes. And I was doing um, a grip fighting clinic at uh, our Welcome at Club for Kenny Brinks Juniors one, one night. And uh, Kyle Elliott was helping me. He's a very good young showdown. And um, so he was helping me coach the kids that particular night. And we were just going over the basics of, of how to do gripping uh, to start in like Rondori or a competitive sense. Okay, so uh, like I said, five minutes, and let's talk about the basics of what not to do and the basics of what to do 
in starting your grip fighting. So here we go. No matter what age you are, gripping is an essential part of judo. Okay? Now, there's some fundamental things you should do, some fundamental things you should not do. We're going to cover the bad things first. Okay? So, and when I bow, we start. I'm going to fight Kyle. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. Okay? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Look at my right hand, look at my right foot. Now, tell me what I'm doing wrong. What am I doing wrong? You step with the right foot and, the right, and you put out the right That's exactly hand. right. That's exactly right. So when I'm fighting here and I'm starting, I want to see if I'm leaning with my right foot, I'm going to get my left hand first to jerk him in. Because I don't want to do this because guess what? He could foot sweep me right away. Boom. And I've seen it happen a lot. So if we're coming out here and I do this, bam, I'm asking to get drilled. Okay? All right. So when, we're, when we start, hands up. Now, when, another thing I don't want to do is be all bent over. i got to have a good posture. It's almost like I'm throwing my hips forward when I do this. When you're gripping somebody and they're all bent over, they're off balance. I don't want to be that guy off balance. So I want to be, instead of being like this, you can just dominate me. So I, I want to be upright. Okay? Okay. Now, some other things. When we're doing this, I don't want you making big looping movements with your hands. Everything is like, it's like a boxer would do. Really short, choppy movements with the hands. Don't build big looping movements. If I'm coming out here, it's pretty obvious. Boy, he just nailed, he came in with a nice serenagi and I'm taking a trip. Those are some things you don't want to do. Okay. Right, as soon as you bow, hands up, step forward, hands up, just like how to do that perfect. It's like I'm looking through a screen here. Computer screen, TV screen, whatever, okay? And when I make contact, when we're out gripping, and I make contact, I'm gonna get, my hand is probably gonna be what I call my anchor hand. I got a good anchor on him because now I can start moving and doing other stuff. Okay? I'm going to be grabbing a sleeve as my anchor hand. That's okay. You're going to have one hand you're going to start with and the other hand you're going to get and move around. Right, don't just go in there and go like that because he will stop you. Okay? So have a plan which hand you're going to lead with. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Now, are you doing that now? Are you thinking about that? Kids can think about this. You're not, you're not dumb. Just because you're kids doesn't mean you can't know these things. You should do it. Okay? Yeah. Or adults sometimes too. <laughs> okay, so we're doing this. We'll see. So I got my hand, I got my grip. Now I can start working them. Now, this other hand, what, what we call a power hand, or your steering hand often. Okay? Now that's the hand, and I never want to just kind of grab at the same time because I'm still open and he could come in and hit me with a move. So once I get my first hand here, my anchor, now I'm going to start, as soon as I grip here, I'm going to start moving at the same time. Now, I never like to go forward or backward in a straight line because I'm walking right into a throw. Okay, so when I grab, I'm going to probably move one way or the other, and I'll probably move over to my right like this and get my grip. If you ever watch your coach grip, that's exactly what he does. And he's gripped a lot of guys and set them up with his throws because now I'm thinking in my mind, I want to set this guy up with a throw. So I'm thinking, don't just want to grip him. What do I want to do with that grip? I got to take it to another level. So, like, say you're a Tayotoshi guy, or girl, okay? So I get my grip, and I'm going to circle around on the outside, and as soon as I circle around on the outside, I get my set my hand there, and boom, I shoot in my Tayotoshi. So we can start setting things up right from the get go. A lot of the best grips are the ones you grip and throw with immediately, okay? And I know you guys work on that. Grip and throw. You can grip and throw, foot sweep them. Or set them up with a, a uchimata, so a big throw too. So what we're going to do first, we're we'll do some gripping drills here. But we're going to do as soon as you bow, hands up. Man, that's cardinal rule. You got to have your hands up. Now also, when you're gripping and your hands up, don't go batting away. You get a penalty. It's very defensive, you know, passive, passive stock kind of judo. You don't want to do that. If I'm going to have to bat his hands down, boom, I'll catch and go like that. I want to be able to catch him. We'll talk about that momentarily. But I don't want you batting the hands down like this. I want you to get them and go. Okay? So if he, my hands, his hands are up, Lee here, catch that. He's going to react, isn't he? He's going to kind of pull back, and as he does, I start to set up, and there I go. So that's some stuff I can do to start. Thing right. also, keep your elbows in. Don't extend your arms. Okay? Again, like a boxer. 
You don't see boxers throwing punches like this on TV, do you? They're close and tight. Same with us in judo. Same here. So keep your elbows in. And when I work, boom, like this. Keep them in tight and close. Okay, I covered pretty much what not to do and what to do. I think I, you, you got the gist of what I, how I approach gripping. There are a number of things to do. You're gripping not just with your hands. You're not just hand fighting. You're fighting with your whole body. You're using your whole body to control. You've got to have good posture. You've got to get your shoulders. You've got to have upright posture. You've got to be light on your feet. You've got to be able to move laterally back and forth. All these things come into play in grip fighting. Okay, so it's very important. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about in, in this, uh, I was uh, in another practice at Kenny's place, Ken, Kenny's uh, Welcome at uh, uh, Judo Club, was with uh, Kelvin Nicely, one of our very good black belts, longtime uh, member of our club. And uh, we, were, we were talking about uh, controlling your opponent and what I was, we were coaching some of the guys there and to use your hands like radar. Use your hand like radar. And you'll talk, you'll hear me talk about, and also before you heard me talk about uh, anchor hand and controlling hand, that type of thing. We'll talk about that later. But this is about almost a three minute video of using your hand like radar. So let's look at that right now. Can everybody see this here? Okay, he's having a hold with your left hand here. This is your steering with his hand, it's like a radar, okay? I can, I can feel where Kelvin's moving. If he moves this way, I can sense it and be there in front of him, okay? If he moves this way, I can react and catch him and open them up. So this is your radar hand. This is what he's, it's kind of like your anchor, you know, you anchor here. If, he, if I'm holding this way, does he think I'm a right-sided judo guy or a left-sided judo guy? Left-sided. So lefty. I'm holding a lefty, lefty grip, or I'm holding a lefty grip. So he's thinking lefty, okay? Uh, with, with, you know, Becky, you know, used to train, you know, help coach Kenny. She was a, she was a left-handed judo player, left-handed sambo wrestler. She would hold right <laughs> and attack left all the time because everybody thought she was a right side of, you know. <coughs> and that's true. This is what it is. So if you can hold left here, you're gripping. It's just like you said, beating, getting that inside grip and everything. Yeah. All right. When he moves, you're going to feel it. Okay. So if he just moves one step, I know how to react to catch. And I can get right in there, you know, Kouchi, Ochi. You know, Sainagi, you know, I can even come across and, you know, know Soda Garia stuff. So I'm feeling how he does. This is radar. Just remember that. That's what the coach is trying to get you to do here. So key off him. So what a good way to do that, you're holding here, okay? Force him to move, okay? So get him to move. Now, when I do this, I'm already setting him up. So if I, this is, and I'm going to throw with my, over my right hip or my right side with my left hand here. See how I shifted the hip? Little things make, make a lot of difference. So boom like this. Now, I'm leading with a side I'm going to attack with. I'm leading with my hip. That's what he wants you to do when he said lead with your hip. So when I get him, if he moves this way, well, now I'm in position, I can hit that Sainagi, you know, or Osoto, Kaochi, okay? If he goes the other way, I can deep it in, and I can definitely throw him straight forward Sainagi. So that's what he's trying to get you to do. It's real subtle stuff, but this is the stuff that wins matches, and you're out thinking your opponent. And that's what he wants you to do. So if you get this left hand, how are you going to grip it? There it is. That's your radar. You feel him, how he moves. You keep keep a contact here. Don't just hang on. See, I'm using the inside of my hand here on his shoulder. And I can feel that when he moves. If he, if he were to move backward, boom, I can catch. There's the opening. I slide right under for my Nagi probably. Because I like Nagi. That's what I'm looking for a lot. Does that make sense to everybody? So you use this like radar. You got to you can feel where he goes. You can guide him where he goes too. You know, if I don't if I don't want him to move this way, okay, I'm going to pull this way and cut him off, so he can't move that way. So you got these little subtle things work. All right, I think I made my point about that to use your hand like radar. So let's expand that conversation a little bit about different types of grips. Okay, and, I, and what I'm going to talk about right now is, is why I first heard it from my, my great coach, uh, God rest his soul, Rene Pomerel, and then I also heard it a lot in Sambo, these concepts I'm going to talk about right now, was about a short grip and a long grip. Okay, let's talk about that first. When you're gripping your opponent, especially competitively, okay, um, a short grip means you're controlling his shoulders. You're gripping him. He's closer to you. It's a shorter gripping distance between you two, between you and your opponent. So you might be controlling a, a lapel, a shoulder, might even the arm, but you're controlling, 
you're really controlling his shoulders. Okay, so that's it is that, and you're manipulating his shoulders. You control his shoulders, you will control his hips. If you control his hips, you control his movement. It's just a, a chain of chain of things that happen. Okay, so by a short grip. By gripping up in the control, maybe as your initial grip, we'll talk about anchor hands in a minute, but when you grip them there, as you can see my hands here, when you grip them and pull and you've got a short grip on them right now, you may just hold it for a few seconds, but I may use it a lot where I come in and control them and I want them close to my body. where we have, There's a short distance between our shoulders and upper torso area. So that's why we've always called it a short grip, okay, or compact grip, I've heard some people call it maybe some other names, but in other words, there's a shortage of distance between the two bodies, okay? Now, a long grip, again, there, there are advantages to having a short grip for certain things you want to do. A long grip is a longer distance between you and your opponent's body. So often you'll have a lower sleeve grip or maybe a sleeve grip, and there's some distance between your torso, starting at your shoulders, and his torso. So there's a longer distance you know, between the, the grips, okay, between the two bodies of the, the two opponents, as it were. So a long grip might be a low sleeve grip to control someone, and then you can use that to manipulate them any way you wish, or a, a double sleeve grip. You know, you might have a, a, a long grip one-handed, and you a lot of distance between you higher up on his shoulder area, but there's a distance between you and his body. So that's a longer grip. You say, well, what's the, what's the purpose of that? Why, why bother to know that stuff? Well, if you can control somebody with his shoulders, you will control his hips, you will control his movement. That's why it's kind of good to know between a short grip and a long grip, because I use that often. I have used it for years in explaining to my athletes, if you get a shorter, more compact grip, it's kind of like being an infighting in boxing. You know, it's, it's like two boxers. You might have a Muhammad Ali or a Floyd Mayweather style, if you're boxing fans like me, that work from a long distance. That's a long grip, okay? Long distance fighting, a lot of jabs, a lot of movement. And a shorter grip, you still might have a pretty fast movement tempo, fast pace of the match, but you're closer together. You're, you're, you're more like some of the old-time fighters that were, you know, in fighters that really get in and, and slug it out, and, and like at Arturo Gotti or Mickey Ward, some of those guys who were, they were dynamite in fighters. They'd get inside and bang. Well, that's kind of the difference between in fighting and boxing and a long range in boxing, short grip in judo, Short, a long grip in judo. So you see the difference. They're good to know. Some people like to have a more close, compact grip to each other, you know, closer. It's their judo. It's how it works. So understand that. It's a good way of understanding. And, and from, a, from a mechanical standpoint, uh, when teaching, uh, you might have students that will drift, that will naturally want to be short grippers or long grippers. If that's the case, expand it. You know, you might have to teach it to them. But it's it's and, and again, you're not always a short gripper. You're not always a long gripper. You might for a certain setup, you might have a one a longer grip, and you control it. Okay, and you control those grip with that. So there you go on short grips and long grips. At least how it's always been explained to me, and how I like to explain to my my students. Now another concept is an anchor hand and an attacking hand, or a, you know, you can use it different, you know, it's your hunting hand. I've heard it called that as well. I forget what book I saw that in, but, it was a, but I always call it my attacking hand. It might be a probing hand, but that gets, you know, like, no, I'm not a doctor probing you. I mean, it's, it's a, the hand back. But the first hand is the anchor hand. That's generally the hand, not always the first hand you grip them with, but usually is, and that's the one you latch on to first and control him for maybe just a short period of time till you get to a better grip that you like. But that's the anchor. It's like setting, it's like you, you know, a, show, uh, a ship, you know, uh, you know, in the harbor, sets the anchor. That's boom. You set that anchor and hold on to it, and that's what you control your opponent with that anchor hand. Okay, and that's and you heard me talk about that in the earlier videos. So that's an anchor hand. And so you might have that control them with your anchor hand just momentarily, and then. Boom, you get your other hand in there, it's your attacking hand, you might set him up, and that, and you might hold him with that, and that might be, become your anchor hand now, and so you move him around and set him up for another grip. So you can see how it may shift back and forth. But you, your hands work independently of each other, but also in conjunction with each other. So it's important to know these things about gripping when you coach and when you teach people that the difference, here's an anchor hand, you set him up, control him with that initially, boom, you may move him into something else. You may hold that anchor for a long time. But it's important to know when you coach people 
that, that there is an anchor hand and there's an attacking hand, and they may switch back and forth. Uh, again, you may not use that terminology. You may say, well, it's just totally, it's, it's a lot of extra verbiage. I don't need to tell my people. You don't need to tell them what it is. Just show them and say how important it is to control somebody with these types of grips. So that's it on short grip, long grip, anchor hand, and attacking hand. Now we're going to get into a third one on how to train for good gripping. But before we do, just one last thing, hear me, hear me out. There are some essentials in gripping, in grip fighting, okay, that you must have if you want to use your grip to effectively throw your opponent. So let me start out with that. Your grip should match your throw. You know, your throws just don't come out of nowhere. You've got to, you've got to manipulate your opponent with the type of grip you want to use for the type of a throwing attack you want to use. So the grip and the throw have to combine with each other. Okay, so that takes training, and that takes a lot of time and effort and training. So, so work on that. That's one aspect of it. But initially, you have to have good posture to have good You can't be all bent over. can't be crouched. You can't be heavy-footed. Here's another thing. You've got to have good movement. So you've got to be light on your feet. And I don't mean, uh, you know, dance around. I mean be able to move effectively with your feet. But your posture starts all that stuff. You've got to have good upright posture to be able to have good gripping skills, to be able to get your body in position to attack and defend, okay? Um, your initial stance is important. Okay, you don't, if I'm, if, I'm a, if I'm leading with my right foot, I don't just stick out my right hand because he could sweep me. Okay, you could do a good, I'm, I'm off balance. Okay, so your stance is very important. Your stance comes from good posture. Okay, so again, if you want good gripping skills, you got to have good posture, you got a good, good initial stance, and keep that stance. You may change your stance as the fight goes on. You got to do it. Okay, um, you want to control your opponent's shoulders. You steer them with your shoulders. I often say kill his shoulders. You know, kill, kill his movement in his shoulders. Shut him down. You know, if you can pull, pull a guy's shoulders down and control that, he has to fight to get that squared back up. And while he's doing that, you may hit your attack in. So if you kill his shoulders, control his shoulders, like we talked about earlier, short grips, that's a good way. When you grab somebody by the sleeve, you're not just controlling his arm. You want to control his shoulder. So if you can control it at the source and control that better, even better for controlling him. So... You know, you know, that's just the way I look at it myself. Um, always try to control your opponent's power hand. So if I'm a righty and my right hand is set there, I want to set it up for like an Osotogari or something, or I want to manipulate with that, or, you know, my anchor hand's my right power hand, my opponent will try to negate my power hand. He'll try to shut down my power hand. He'll attack that. He'll try to block that, nullify that, so he can have a better attack. If he can pull a hand off, my power hand off of him, uh, better for him. Okay, so that's really important to do. So, so negate, control your opponent's power hand, and it's 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 that's an essential. Controlling his power hand. I often instead of I always teach my students to myself. I like to move laterally, sideways. Even if I'm moving in a circle, I'm moving laterally. I don't ever walk into my opponent. Sometimes I may have to step maybe one step back to hit him with a throw, but I try never to walk directly into my opponent because you're walking right into a throw. And that, that's a part of the movement, but it's also part of your gripping sequence. As soon as you bow, like in judo or in sambo, as soon as you shake hands, get to your mark, referee says go, hajime, boom. I start, start moving laterally to set him up so he can get the better grip. That's, that's where the grip fight starts, okay? And the rules of judo only give you so long, the rules of sambo only give you so long to grip him to start your initial grip. So be aggressive when you do. So that leads into another thing. Once you get your grip, once you get your anchor hand, be very aggressive. Do, begin, like I said before, the first thing we do, we touch our opponents, the first thing with our hands. And how well you control them with your hands and your whole body, your arms and elbows, is how, who dictates the fight. Okay, that's, it really does. Um, always attempt to get the inside grip. That sounds. Sometimes you might get a good back grip. That's if that's your case. You're killing his shoulder, controlling his posture. You can do that. But often, if you get the inside grip first, even if, whether it's on the sleeve or up here on the shoulder lapel somewhere, uh, epaulet and sambo. If I can control again, I can steer him better with it, and I'm, and I'm steering him with with the hand, and I can control him better. So try to get the inside grip to keep him from. If if he has the outside grip. 
He's going to want to get the inside grip off. The, it, it, again, grip fighting is like Rondori, and we're going to see that in a second here, how to train for it. So try to get the inside grip uh, initially, control, and then if you want to get your power hand up there and get a, a back shoulder grip or a back grip or a, go for a Georgian grip and Sambo, you know, you can do that. But try to get the inside grip and control them. It really does. By doing that, you're controlling his shoulders better when you get the inside grip, you get the short grip, okay? Okay. Um, so I said just a few minutes ago, six seconds ago, try to control his posture. Break his posture. If you break his posture, you will break his balance and control his movement. So break his posture. Bend him over as much as possible or set him up, move him around as much as possible, but control how he moves by controlling his posture. And you can do that with your grip. You can do that with your grip and movement together, okay? Um, and... Lastly in this, there are probably other things, but these are off the top of my head what I wrote down before the show here. Try to control the tempo and movement. Okay, you may like to work out of a slower tempo. You may like to work out of a faster tempo. How you set them up uh, for the throw. Um, you may want to set up a fast tempo for a foot sweep. You may want to slow them down to make him heavy on his feet so you, he's kind of plodding along so you can hit him with maybe a knee drop serenagi. Um Think about that. That's part of your strategy and then the tactics you apply during the match. So try to control the tempo of how fast you and your opponent move together. That's the tempo of a match, how fast the opponents move together about the mat. And by doing that, you also control the space between your opponents. It's the third, another one here to remember. Uh, the grip also controls how far we are apart from each other. Okay, So it controls the space. Again, a short grip, long grip type of situation. So these are all factors in grip fighting, that's a lot of stuff, you know. And so how do we train for that effectively? I found the best way over the years, and I've talked to many coaches feel the same way, grip Rondori. And we're going to have about a two-and-a-half-minute video here on grip Rondori. And, again, I'm going to be discussing it and how to do it with Kyle Elliott here uh, when we're doing the, the, the clinic for the Kenny's kids at his, his dojo. But uh, people, instead of doing everything is set, slow – Rondori, it's a free movement. It's basically gripping without throws, pins, chokes, or arm locks. Or what you know, you just don't do it. You're just gripping. I'm trying to outgrip you. You're trying to outgrip me. At some point, that's going to happen. I'm going to outgrip you, and it's, okay, you got me. You can't get out of it. Okay, let's re reengage. Okay, and you can make even score with it if you want to. I think John Saylor back in years back in the 80s and 90s when he was coaching at the Olympic Center, they did their grip Rondori where they. You know, they, they had like a five-minute round or a three-minute round or whatever it was. They were shorter rounds, actually. I guess they were one- or two-minute rounds, now I think about it. But they would actually keep score about who got the dominant grip and the guy couldn't get away. Okay, we re-engage. One for you, zero for you. You know, and, and, and that's how they did it. It's, it's a good way to do it. It's grip Rondori. It's very competitive. Grip Rondori um, – at all levels, if you look what coaching with little kids, training them for their first competition, it's not going to be real intense. But when I was coaching some, some really good guys over the years, the grip Rondori was often every bit as uh, um, aggressive and, um, um, you know, action, as much action in, as regular Rondori. Okay, it was a very aggressive thing, and they took it very seriously. Who could get the better grip? And that's how important it is. So anyway, this third drill, this third uh, video is going to be on grip rondori and how to how to use it as part of your training. So here we go on grip rondori. We're gonna have grip rondori, and what grip rondori is is just like rondori, except you don't really throws or pins or anything like that. It's just gripping, and I'm going to try to outgrip Kyle. Kyle's going to try to outgrip me. We're going to do it for about a minute or so. Then we'll get a new partner. We'll bow and get a new partner. Now, if at some point we're gripping here, and I, you know, I get a better grip than him, and man, I just dominate him and say, "Okay, you got me. Start again." Okay, look, I won the first round. Okay, he might win the second round, but it's like grip Rondori. I want to beat him in Rondori. Now, when you grip Rondori, you got to be real intense. You got to be real intense. You know, when I was coaching young guys and girls for a long, long time in this very room years ago, we would have grip Rondori a lot, okay? And sometimes the gripping would get really, really aggressive and rough, harder than regular Rondori almost. And they just really, really aggressive. So you gotta get that way. You gotta, you gotta remember, this is a fight. It isn't a game, okay? So when we grip, we're gonna do this drill. Now remember, some things I wanna see you do. I wanna start with your hands up, and I don't want you to leave the same side foot. I want you to Cross grip here, and when you get your hook on, you move. 
Don't just stay there and grab, because you're giving him an opportunity to throw you. As soon as I get my grip, as soon as I want to get my grip, whatever it is, like power, uh, here, power hand here, or here, wherever it is, as soon as I get that, boom, I'm going to start moving. I'm going to start setting him up. Okay? Those are some things I want to do in this grip round, okay? this round dory round. But here's what it'll look like. The bow, hands up, and now we'll start fighting for the best grip. Now, now I'm going to try to outgrip him. He's going to try to outgrip me. And it's going to be a real contest. I want you to be really, really aggressive and really competitive in this drill. Okay? Don't be mean or do stupid stuff, but be really competitive. Does that make sense to everybody? That the best way to train, train, train for good, hard grip fighting is to do a lot of grip fighting, but do it right. Okay? So what I'm going to have you do is, as soon as we're going to break here, get a new get a partner, face each other. When, when Coach Kenny says, Hajime, we bow, hands up, get at it, we'll go for a minute. Okay? And then we'll bow to each other, shake hands, get a new partner. We'll go three or four rounds of that, one minute rounds. Okay? I get a partner. Let's go. I recommend doing grip run dory all the time. All the time. If you've got a competitive team, grip run dory should be an essential part of your training just about every practice. And there are a lot of drills, like we do a lot of hip block drills, cut drills, you can combine them with some other things. But the grip rondori is one of those foundational drills I think that all competitive clubs should do. Uh, and I, I know I did it, and we still do it with my recreational students once in a while. I, I coach uh, you know, some guys on a recreational level. By the way, the recreational level doesn't mean it's an easy practice. It's a good, hard practice. But they're not so interested in you know, high-level competition. They're just interested in coming in and do, doing judo for a lot of fun and good phys ed. Yeah, but gripping is part of the game, so uh, it should be part of the game too. Um, but it, it's, it's a drill you should do all the time, it, it, in, it, however you do it. I never did my grip rounds for more than 30, to, 30 seconds to a minute because I don't want people so engaged just in gripping that they forget that the end result is actually the grip sets up the throw, sets up the movement that sets up the throw. So the grip in a chain of events, you know, as you start, again, first hands on them, First thing I do is I grip him. And the, the chain of events are such that I grip him, I want to manipulate him, break his posture, break his balance, control the movement, distance, space, all that stuff. Then I want to attack him with. So I want the grip to match my throw. So I don't want, if they just do grip rondori all the time, they're not going to relate that. Even, even very good level athletes aren't going to relate the grip to the throw. They're going to keep them separate. So they have to integrate together. So, so don't do your grip rondori rounds too long. Uh, but make them intense, and as intense as the, the level of training, you know, uh, is appropriate for. So anyway, so that's so much about gripping, and we talked about the world of belts. You're probably tired of hearing me drone on, but, you know, it was fun talking to you, and I will see you next time.